Okay, seniors, so we got here the Battle of Antietam, which is, um, is uh, 17th and 18th of September, 1862. Okay, so Lee has invaded Maryland, and now McClellan got, uh, heard about what his plans were because they, they captured some of the orders, they found some of the orders, and now the two armies are, are going to meet in battle, right? All right, so what is McClellan's plan? McClellan's plan. McClellan's plan is that there are three corps. Corps is a, uh, uh, the <clears throat> largest division within the army, okay, the, or the largest grouping within the army. It, it, it can range in size, but they can be upwards of around 20,000 guys in a corps, okay? And so McClellan's plan is that he's going to have three of his corps attack and leave one to do a kind of diversionary measure. So these two up here constitute one of the corps. They're going to be an attacking corps. These two lines over here are attacking corps. And then this grouping here, the third one that's going to attack. The fourth one was uh, Burnside's Ninth Corps, okay, which was, going to, was supposed to have a kind of diversionary tactic to draw troops um, or to distract um, the rebels from the main force of the attack up here, okay? And of course, the whole idea is to really crush uh, Lee's army, and if you do that, then basically you end the war, okay? That's the idea. So McClellan has the opportunity here, because of his superior numbers, to crush Lee's army and basically force the South to surrender, because what are they going to do after that? They don't have enough men to replace those that are here at Antietam, Okay. Now, it's a pretty good plan, but it doesn't, it doesn't end up working according to what McClellan wanted, okay? And we'll get to that at the end, all right? <clears throat> now, the fighting begins uh, uh, in this area, okay? And it's very heavy here in what's called the West Woods, the West Woods right here, and a cornfield adjacent to it. So this is where the battle starts, early in the morning. <clears throat> and it starts when Joe Hooker, who is a Union commander, Joe Hooker, the blue is the Union, uh, comes down and attacks the rebels here and pushes, starts to push them back, okay? And then you get some other soldiers coming down. They push them into the West Woods where they confront them. Now, <clears throat> they're coming down along this road called the Hagerstown Pike. This is the road adjacent to which they're coming down. Okay, and uh, then the Union is also sending in troops from this direction as well, okay? Um, <clears throat> there's three waves of Union assaults throughout the morning. And <clears throat> it's kind of a back and forth thing. Sometimes the Confederate line is breaking, is disintegrating, but Lee will send in reinforcements to shore it up, okay? And the fighting is incredibly intense. Uh, some of the most intense fighting of the war occurs here, okay? And they fight on uh, until about 5 p.m. In the, in the evening, and 12,000 people die in this area alone, okay? Very intensive fighting here in the West Woods and the cornfields, all right? Um, <clears throat> the second place where there is very heavy fighting is in the center of the rebel line. The rebels are in red here. The center of the rebel line along what's uh, this road here. This is a sunken road, which again is not uncommon in rural areas to have two fields and a sunken road in between them. It's a little bit lower down than the two fields there. And the, the rebels are uh, lined up here along this sunken road. And it earns the nickname Bloody Lane because of how terrible the fighting is here. And here you have um, two divisions or two large groupings of soldiers coming down from this core up here, down to the bloody lane, right, this way. And then you have also people come in reinforcing it this way, right? All right, so you've got um, a lot of fighting there, bodies piling up, very a terrible thing. Now, the rebel line is broken here. The Union breaks the rebel line.
and they could have had a, a, a really a catastrophic, um, that could have had a really catastrophic effect on the rebel army, only McClellan doesn't exploit the opportunity. What he should have done was send in more reinforcements to exploit the break in the rebel line, and he doesn't do it, and they lose the opportunity, okay? So again, McClellan hesitates, doesn't do the right thing, doesn't get the result that he, that, that he needs, which is the destruction of the army and forcing the capitulation of the South. Now, the last place that there's heavy fighting here in Antietam is uh, along a bridge, and we call it Burnside's Bridge because Burnside is the Union commander who's trying to cross the bridge and attack the rebels who are holding it, who are defending it, okay? And the bridge is right here, Burnside's Bridge, and it's crossing the creek, Antietam Creek, which comes out into the Potomac River here, and this creek is what the battle is named after. Okay, and the closest town is the town of Sharpsburg right here. Okay, so Burnside is, spends all morning trying to take the bridge so his soldiers could cross it. This was a huge mistake because the soldiers could have forded the creek in other places and then come around to attack this fellow Longstreet, who's a rebel commander here. Okay, but they spend all morning trying to take this bridge. And of course, it's easy to defend the bridge because it's like a, a funnel and you just shoot the guys down as they're running at you, okay? So finally, by midday, this, they've, they've started to establish a little bit of a foothold at the base of the bridge. By midday, they've gained um, <clears throat> some advantage. And so uh, by mid-afternoon, they've crossed the bridge, and they're also now, at this point, figured out they can cross the creek in other places. So by mid-afternoon, Burnside's troops, who are supposed to be doing a diversionary thing, right, are now attacking Longstreet, okay? And this could have been, a, this could have been the conclusive moment of the battle as well, right? There was the opportunity lost up here. There's going to be another opportunity lost here with Burnside's men, okay? So what happens is that Longstreet's men are uh, sort of flagging. This, uh, the Union has gained the advantage, and if Burnside can push through this rebel line here and defeat Longstreet, then he can swing around and he can cut off the rebels from their escape route up, back across the Potomac out of Maryland, back into the Confederacy, into Virginia, all right? And that would have, that would have basically been another way in which um, McClellan could have won so decisively as to force the surrender of the South. But again, McClellan does not send in enough reinforcements to push through um, the rebel line here as it's disintegrating late in the day. And he hesitates, and what happens is this guy, A.P. Hill, who had been at Harper's Ferry, who had taken Harper's Ferry, and the reason they'd done that, right, if you remember from the last lecture, was so that they could establish supply lines running from the Confederacy, Confederate troops in Maryland back into, um, through Harper's Ferry, into the, back then into the Confederacy in Virginia, where they could send ammunition. Okay, well, A.P. Hill had taken Harper's Ferry and then hightailed it as fast as he could over here across the Potomac uh, to reinforce Lee's troops at Antietam. And he arrives later in the day, and he reinforces what we call the right flank here, the southern uh, part of Lee's line, line here, and then he is able to save the day here for the rebel troops, A.P. Hill's arrival there, okay? So that's A.P. Hill saving the day there at Burnside's Bridge. <clears throat> okay, now, the result of all this, what's, what's the aftermath? Now, strategically, it is a victory for the Union. Okay, strategically, it's a victory for the Union. Why? Well, because the, the following day, in the evening, Lee is going to retreat, and his offensive into the North fails. Okay? So what happens is, the following day, <coughs> September 18th, Lee's men are um, almost totally obliterated. There had been, <clears throat> what, something like 55,000 of them or so? Uh, well, there's about 30,000 left who aren't, you know, <clears throat> who are able to fight, okay? But Lee isn't, isn't retreating yet. He stands there the whole following day, September 18th, and waits for McClellan to attack. McClellan does not attack. And then finally, again, another big mistake here. And so finally on the evening, of September 18th, Lee retreats. And so it's a strategic victory for the North, 
because Lee's offensive ends. Lee retreats. However, Lee's army also survives. So whereas McClellan had the opportunity to really definitively end the war by crushing the army of Northern Virginia, Lee's army, he doesn't do it, okay? And so the war is going to continue, all right? Now, in terms of the consequences of this battle, it is one of the turning points of the war. Okay, one of the most important turning points of the war, all right? Now, first of all, there are horrific casualty rates. This battle is one day, right? And it has, um, <clears throat> it has over 20, it has like 23,000 casualties dead and wounded. 6,000 men are dead or dying by the end of the day, and there's another 17,000 wounded. Okay, to put this into perspective, this is more than the, the casualties from Shiloh, which was two days of fighting. This is twice as many who had died in all the previous wars, the War of 1812, the Mexican War and the Spanish-American War combined, excluding the Revolutionary War, okay? And it's four times as many casualties as the Americans would suffer at D-Day in World War II. So it's a huge and catastrophic day of fighting, one of the bloodiest days in the war. And uh, it's often talked about like there was this almost frenzy that came over the soldiers in Antietam on both sides with the ferocity with which they were fighting. And that was really, uh, especially for the Southerners, that shocked the Northerners because the Southerners had been marching, going on these exhaustive marches and these, out, these uh, intense maneuvering campaigns in Virginia with not, not enough food, so on and so forth. So it was um, remarkable that they had the energy to fight as ferociously as they did, okay? Now, as far as the other consequences, two really important ones. The first one is, look, one thing that the South wanted to get out of this, if they could gain a victory in Northern Territory, was they were hoping that Europeans, especially the British, would recognize the Confederacy as an independent nation. The fact that they've lost in the North is basically means this, there's not going to be much hope of that. Europeans, the British in particular, are not going to be, they're not going to recognize the Confederacy as an independent nation, okay? Two, politically speaking, this gives Lincoln the victory he needs in order to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. We will get into the politics of that tomorrow, but Lincoln needed this victory in order to make, to, um, um, justify on a, in a political way, right, a kind of a cynical way, because he, he wanted people not to object to it too much, the Emancipation Proclamation. So we'll deal with that tomorrow, but essentially Antietam paves the way for the Emancipation Proclamation, okay? That is the most important consequence of Antietam. All right, we'll deal with that tomorrow. Okay, be good.